In this video, we are going to implement the Stable Fluids algorithm by Yostam using the fast Fourier transformation in the Julia programming language in roughly 200 to 300 lines of code. So let's get started. Hi and welcome to this new video. Stable Fluids is an algorithm by Yostam to solve the equations of fluid motion unconditionally stable. That means we can use arbitrarily large time step. It is therefore widely used in fluid animation and it's also a super simple way to get a first simulation started. Here we want to use the extension that is using the fast Fourier transformation to obtain even faster simulations. The stable fluids algorithm works for the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations that I've listed here, but you won't be seeing them in this form later on in the video. The scenario we want to look at is a unit square domain with periodic boundary conditions. This means that the fluid on the left edge equals the fluid on the right edge and the fluid on the bottom edge equals the fluid on the top edge. So whatever flows over the top edge enters back in the bottom edge. And then we want to start with a fluid at rest. So we have zero velocity everywhere in the domain. And over time we apply two forces or two patches of forces, one in this area of the domain and one of this and the force patch in the left is pointing to the right whereas the force patch on the right is pointing to the left. This is then creating fluid motion in this direction as well as in this direction and at some point they will then collide somehow and create beautiful vortices that we can visualize. The stable fluids algorithm with the FFT works like this. As said, we will start with a zero velocity all throughout the domain and then we iterate over time with certain time steps. In the first step, we apply our forces. So we add the two force patches to our velocity field. Then we have to account for the convection or self-advection of the fluid, which is also the nonlinear aspect in the Navier-Stokes equations. And here we will use the same procedure as in the classical stable fluids algorithm which is also called a semi-Lacrangian step and it works like this that we trace the fluid backwards on its streamline and then update the fluid velocity at a certain vertex to be the velocity at this streamline traced backwards in time. You will also see that in detail later and the advantage of this approach is that it is unconditionally stable. So we can choose arbitrarily large time step and still obtain a stable simulation. The next two step in the algorithm differs from the classical implementation in that we want to perform the diffusion and the projection to incompressibility in the Fourier domain. For this, we first have to transform our fluid velocities into the Fourier domain by transforming each of the scalar components of the velocity field. So in other words, the X component and the Y component, and then we can first perform a diffusion. And in essence, a diffusion is nothing else than a low pass filtering. So we apply some sort of a Gaussian shape depending on the wave number, such that high wave numbers are penalized more than smaller wave numbers. And this then allows us to kind of mimic diffusion in this Fourier domain. And these diffused fields can then be made incompressible by first computing the pseudo pressure in the Fourier domain. In essence, we are evaluating the divergence in the Fourier domain by multiplying our diffused velocity fields with the normalized wave numbers. And here remind yourself that the wave number for a two dimensional Fourier transformation is also a vector. So we are multiplying a vector with a vector and then we are getting out a scalar, which is our pseudo pressure. This pseudo pressure can then be used to correct our velocities to be incompressible, which basically means we are subtracting the gradient of our pseudo pressure. And here we are again taking advantage of the fact that differentiation is way easier in the Fourier domain. And then we have a velocity field in the Fourier domain that is incompressible, so we can transform it back into the spatial domain with the inverse Fourier transformation, again by transforming each of the scalar components individually. And this can be repeated over and over depending on how long we want to run our simulation. The case that appear here are the spatial frequencies, and here you could also call it the wave numbers. And since we have a two-dimensional scenario, they consist a set of two components. Basically, those are the frequencies 
for which the Fourier transformation is computing the coefficients. And then I want to highlight that these Fourier transformations implicitly prescribe the periodic boundary conditions and that is because the Fourier transformation requires these periodicities at the domain edges. So this approach here also only works if we have those periodic boundary conditions. Okay, then let's start implementing this algorithm. We want to do that in Julia. So let's first import all the packages that we need here. And we need the FFTW package, the fastest Fourier transformation in the West, which basically allows us to perform the FFT efficiently. Then we will use the plots package for visualization. I want to use the progress meter package as a progress meter. I need the interpolations package for our backtracing on the streamline. And I will also use the linear algebra package in order to normalize the wave numbers at a certain point. And then let's also define some constants of our simulation. So let's say we want to have 250 points per axis. Then let's define the kinematic viscosity to be 0 0.0001. Then let's set the time step length of our simulation to 0 0.01 and say we want to perform 50 time steps. Then let us define a main function and instantly call it so that it is executed. And let's remove the space here and then we can start. Then we can start by first inferring the element length of our Cartesian grid or uniform grid that we want to use here for simplicity as being the domain length per axis, which is one since we have a unit square domain divided by the number of points minus one. Since we have number of points minus one discrete elements there, then we can define an X interval or the X mesh basically, which goes from zero to one and it is using the element length as a step. So basically this Imagine the element length would be 0 0.1, then this would be a range being 0 0.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and so on, all the way to including 1.0. The y interval looks quite similar, so we have this as well, 0 0.0, and then element length, and then 1.0. Now we can create a two-dimensional mesh, essentially by using some sort of a tensor product between these two ranges. If you are familiar with NumPy or with MATLAB, that is essentially the mesh grid operation, and this then yields, yeah, a two-dimensional array. So I want to call this coordinates x or the x component of our mesh. And this one will be x or the x in x interval and y in y interval. So we have some sort of a nested list comprehension here, which is then yielding a two-dimensional array, aka a matrix. And we can do something similar for the coordinates in y by instead using the y here. And for reference, I will just enter this here. So this is similar to mesh grid in NumPy or MATLAB. And then we can also use the information on the mesh to define our wave numbers. For this, I will first create something that I will call wave numbers 1D. And for this, we use a function from the FFTW package, which is called FFT frequencies which is yielding the frequencies associated with a certain number of points. So we just say FFT frequency on n points. And this FFT frequency is basically returning an array of frequencies. And this one is normalized by number of points. So we want to denormalize it by multiplying with n points once again. And then similar to the mesh, we can use these wave numbers in one dimension to build up the two-dimensional wave numbers, which have an X and Y component. So here we have a two-dimensional array with the X coordinates of our mesh and with the Y coordinates of our mesh. And then we will have now a two-dimensional array with the X component of our wave numbers and the Y components of our wave numbers. So let's say wave numbers X is, is KX. So the X component of the wave number or kx in wave numbers 1d as well as ky in wave numbers 1d and we can obtain something similar with the wave numbers in y using ky here and we can also obtain the norm of each wave number with its x and y components by saying wave numbers norm being the norm which is from the linear algebra package of a vector that consists of kx and ky 
and then we do our list comprehension for kx in wave numbers 1d and ky in wave numbers 1d and of course we have to use an equal sign here to assign this and then we have the normed wave numbers and then if we look at this decay that we have in the diffusion this is something that we can pre-compute here so it is a quantity that depends on the kinematic viscosity it depends on the time step delta as well as the wave number norm squared basically and then we have an expression depending on the spatial frequency how much it is damped in the Fourier domain. I will just call this the decay and say the decay is the exponential applied element wise to the negative time step length element wise multiplied with the kinematic viscosity element wise multiplied with the wave numbers norm being element wise squared. And then for the projection to incompressibility, we require the normalized wave numbers, which are the wave numbers divided by their norm. So we can do this because we now have the wave numbers vector as well as the norm. So let's write that down by saying normalized wave numbers in X are the wave numbers in X element wise divided by the wave numbers norm. And something similar can be done for the wave numbers in y. So this one are so this one are the wave numbers in y element wise divided by the wave numbers norm. The wave numbers norm could be zero, which stems from the fact that we have a zero vector as a wave number. So in that case, I just want to set the wave numbers norm to one such that we don't have an invalid division here. And we can easily do that by saying wave numbers norm exist when we call is zero element wise on the wave numbers norm and then we set this one to one. So wherever the wave numbers norm is zero, I want it to be one such that our division is valid. Then we can define our forces. And if we look back at the scenario, we see that we have these two patches here, but for simplicity, we can also assume that we have two Gaussian peaks centered at this position and centered at this position so that it's kind of a little smoother and then we will just add them. So we have a Gaussian peak that is positive here and it is negative there and then this superposition will be the forcing in X and we won't have any forcing in the Y direction. So let's say force in X. So force in X is consisting of the following components and Gaussian in the one point so we do element wise exponential of the following centering we say coordinates x element wise subtracted with 0 0.2 since we want to center that in x at 0 0.2 and then we have to square that plus and then coordinates y element wise subtracted with 0 0.45 and then let's raise that also by the power of 2. So we have that centered at 0 0.45 in y direction. So not at 0 0.5 since we want the other one to be at 0 0.55 so that they are slightly offset. And then we can multiply that with a standard deviation you could say. And I want to use a 0 0.005 standard deviation. So I do 1.0 divided by 2 times 0 0.005. Let me add some spaces here and then we can multiply this. And of course, we also need the negative sign here in order to get our Gaussian. And then to this Gaussian, we can add our other Gaussian, which will be centered at 0 0.8 in X and 0 0.55 in Y direction. And then I also want to make this forcing quite strong. So I will have a prefactor of 100 here that is multiplied with this forcing. And then before we enter our time loop, let's pre-allocate all the arrays that we need. So pre-allocate all arrays and next to the coordinates array we also need a backtraced coordinates array so we say backtraced coordinates in x will be an array that is identical to the coordinates in x but we want to fill it with zeros for convenience and we can do something similar in y then we can define our velocity array by saying the velocity in x being also an array that is of the same shape as the coordinates in x 
but will also be filled with zeros here for convenience. And here the same in Y. And of course we fill it with zeros because we wanted to prescribe a zero initial condition. And then since we have our time looping, we not just need one array for each velocity component, but we need another one in order to refer to the values from the previous iteration. So I will just say velocity x previous being again a zero way of the same shape as velocity x and velocity y previous will be same as velocity y but also filled with zeros here. And then we also need arrays for the values in the Fourier transformation and I will just call this velocity x fft being the same shape as the velocity in x and we can use zeros here for allocating a similarly shaped array and let's do the same for velocity y fft velocity y and then we also need the pressure or this pseudo pressure in the Fourier transformation being also an array of this shape let's just use any of the coordinates but basically it has the same shape as all the other arrays that we are allocating here okay then we can finally start with our time loop by saying for iteration in one two n time steps and insert the end here and then i will just use the show progress macro that allows us to get a simple progress meter and i will just use an string here say time stepping in order to indicate what kind of progress meter we have and then the first step in the algorithm was to apply the forces and we will do that explicitly by first inferring the current time which is the iteration minus one times the time step length since we start with one in our range here the first iteration will then be one minus one which is zero times the time step length. So we are at time zero. And then in the iteration index two, we have two minus one, which is one times time step length. Then we are at 0 0.01 and so on and so forth. And then I just want to have a linear decay in the application of our forcing by saying a prefactor is the maximum of one minus the current time and zero. So it will linearly decay from time zero to time one and then afterwards it is just one and then we can apply the forces but we only want to apply it in the x direction since there is no forcing in y direction so we say the velocity in x direction from the previous iteration and we will just use that array in order to override it and say this one is plus equal to the time step length times the prefactor times the force in x direction. The next step is to perform the self advection. So it's a self advection by backtracing and interpolation. So we want to implement two functions that backtrace and then one that interpolates. And let's do that before our main function by saying function backtrace and I want to use a function that operates in place. So I will use the Julia convention by adding an exclamation mark at the end. And this will be a function that takes the backtraced positions or an array that is um, used in order to save the backtracing. It will take the original positions as well as a direction. And then we apply a simple Euler step backwards in time. So Euler step backwards in time by saying that the backtraced positions are the original positions minus the time step length multiplied with the direction. So the direction tells us where we are going and then we say how far we're going depending on the time step length and we are going backwards in time therefore we use the minus and so our backtraced positions are the original positions minus the backtracing. And I'm using this colon here in order to say that we override the values in our allocated or pre-allocated array. Since we could potentially leave our domain here, I want to clamp the values back into the unit square domain. And this can be done by calling the clamp command on the backtrace positions and saying that they have to be clamped between zero and one since in each axis 
we have a zero lower limit and a one upper limit. Well, then we can call this function in our time loop by saying backtrace on the backtraced coordinates in x. And these backtraced coordinates in x are given by the coordinates x being backtraced alongside the velocity x previous. And a similar thing can be said for the backtraced coordinates in y. They are the coordinates in y backtraced by the velocity y previous or from the previous iteration. Next up, we need a function to interpolate because when we backtrace on the streamline, we could potentially not land on a vertex. So it could also be in a cell that is defined by the values of the velocities at its four corners. So we have to define a bilinear interpolation, or which would be the simplest way to do it. And for this, I want to use a function that I call interpolate positions. So function interpolate positions. And let's also do that in place with the exclamation mark. Let me remove the new line here. And this interpolate field takes the following arguments. So we first have a variable called field interpolated. So this is the pre-allocated array in which we want to save the result of our interpolation. Then we need the field that we want to interpolate. We need the interval in x as well as the interval in y. And we need the query points in x as well as the query points in y. These query points are then the backtrace positions. These are basically the points at which we want to query our interpolation. Let's first define an interpolator object or an struct that is defining our interpolation by saying interpolator being the linear interpolation from the interpolations package. And this one takes first a two-dimensional mesh or one-dimensional, but we want to use it in a two-dimensional tensor sense. So this one is defined via the interval in x and the interval in y direction. And it is associated with the field. So it's basically building up the mesh over which we have our velocity field defined. And then we can query it at point that are within this mesh by saying that the field interpolated, and again, I'm using the colon to operate on this field in place is given as the interpolator called on the query points in X and the query points in Y. And we have to use the dot notation here to broadcast that over the multidimensional arrays that we would enter here. And let me also remove the new line. So then we can use this function in order to ask for the interpolated field within our time loop and say interpolate positions on the velocity in x. So we want to save the interpolated field in the velocity x, some sort in the sense of the values of this new time iteration. And for this, we want to use the values from the previous iteration. We have the x interval that we already defined. We have the y interval that we already defined. And the query points in x are our backtraced coordinates. So we have the backtraced coordinates in x and uh, backtraced coordinates in y direction. And we do something similar for the velocities y component. So we say velocity y is given by interpolating the velocities y from the previous iteration using the same intervals and the same backtraced coordinates. This is the second step of the stable fluids algorithm done. Then we can do the third step, which starts first by transforming our velocities into the Fourier domain. So say 3.1 transform into Fourier domain. For this we say velocity x FFT is the fast Fourier transformation applied to the velocity in x. And then we can do something similar to the velocities in y by saying velocity y FFT is the FFT applied to the velocity in y. Then we have first our diffusion by saying 3.2 diffuse by low pass filtering. So we say the velocity x FFT is multiplied equal with the decay. So we say that the velocity x FFT is the velocity x FFT multiplied with the decay. And we have to add a dot here in order to make an element wise multiplication. And we do something similar for the y component such that we 
low pass filter or entire velocity field in the Fourier domain. Then step 3.3 is to compute the pseudo pressure. So we say compute pseudo pressure by divergence in Fourier domain and then we get our pressure FFT and we will save that in our pre-allocated arrays by multiplying the velocity x FFT with its normalized wave numbers and here we have to be particularly careful to use the element wise multiplication since these are both two-dimensional arrays which Julia interprets as matrices and if we didn't use the element wise multiplication you'd otherwise use matrix multiplication that would be wrong in that sense and then let's do a plus and say velocity y fft element wise multiplied with the normalized wave numbers in y and then we can use our pseudo pressure to correct the velocities or to make them incompressible correct would be to say to project so we do step 3.4 project the velocities to be incompressible so we say the velocity x fft is minus equal so velocity x fft minus the following component pressure fft element wise multiplied with the normalized wave numbers in x something similar can be done for the velocity components in y by multiplying it with the normalized wave numbers in y direction and then we have our velocity fields updated but we are still in the Fourier domain so let's project them back into the spatial domain by using the inverse Fourier transformation so transform back into spatial domain and then we have the velocity x being the i fft so inverse fft applied to the velocity x fft we can do something similar for the velocity in y and then we have that also transformed back and now we have to account for the fact that if we transform our velocities into the Fourier domain here this returns complex valued numbers so these are complex valued and if we then transform them back theoretically we would only get real valued numbers back since we entered the Fourier transformation with also only real valued numbers however due to numerical rounding error we might have a non-zero imaginary part there so we will just select the real valued component here that's that we are then back just working with real valued vectors of our velocity field so I will just do real and the same here and then we should be good to go and this is already all the parts of the time step for the algorithm so the last step is just to advance in time by saying that the velocities previous are the velocities in x and the velocity y previous are the velocities in y and then this should already compute but we also want to visualize it so I will say visualize and if you recall from the beginning we had a plot with these red and blue colors basically what was presented was a contour plot or a heat map plot of the curl and the curl describes the swirliness of our vector field and it is obtained by a differentiation for this we have to take the derivative of the x component of our velocity field with respect to y and the y component of the velocity field with respect to x i would call this du d y so the derivative of the first velocity component with respect to the second axis and we can use the convenience routine diff from julia that applies a differentiation on high dimensional arrays and we apply this to the velocities in x and we can then use the dims keyword argument and set this to two to differentiate over the second the y axis let's do something similar for the differentiation of v with respect to x for this we have to take the velocity y array and differentiate with respect to one or with the one array but we have to be a little bit careful the differentiation is reducing the length of the array alongside the axis we are differentiating over so this means that here in that case this returns an array that is of shape n points by n points minus one and it is no longer square so we will just for simplicity ignore the very first point in the first axis such that we then have an array that is of shape n points minus one by n points minus one so we say from this array select from two to the end so ignore the first most point and then all points in the second axis 
And here we have to do it the other way around, all points in the first axis, and then ignore the first point in this second axis. And then our curl is defined as du dy minus dv dx. And we can visualize it using the heat map from plots, which takes the interval in x, the interval in y, as well as the curl. But I have to transpose it here using the apostrophe such that it is matching how we would expect it to look like. Not otherwise, um, Heatmap would interpret it as an image which uses a different origin of the coordinate system. And I want to use a certain color map here that I think is particularly beautiful. And its name is, I will just copy that in, it's diverging BKR 5510 whatever. And this one is part of an another package, not of plots. So I already noted that down. This one could require the color schemes.jl package. So in case it does not run for you, you might have to install it. But of course, you could also always use a different color scale that is built into the plots package. Then we also need to call the display command on the heat map. And I will delete these additional new lines. And we need a display in order for the script to visualize our plot and also to update it with each iteration time step that we do. Okay, then there is the moment of truth. Let's run the code. So let's say Julia stable fluids FFT. And then in the beginning, we have the typical yeah, overhead of Julia, 15 to 20 seconds of just-in-time compilation, preparation, and so on and so forth, including the packages. And here, since we use quite some packages, this of course takes the time it takes. And soon we should then see a plot popping up that is using or showing us um, the, the, the heat map, at least if everything worked correctly. And here we go. Well, that is not working particularly well. So let's see where the arrow could be. I think maybe it's in the forcing. Yes. So here you see that um, we have these two Gaussian blobs that we once created. And the one blob is moving to the right and the other one should be moving to the left. However, then we need to use a subtraction instead of an addition here. And then we can run it again. However, since we might then want to run it a couple more times, I want to use a flag to the Julia interpreter. And this is the dash i, which then enters after the completion of the script, a Julia interactive REPL session for which all the functions are already compiled. So we can just call the main function. You will see this in a second. But of course, this again takes the first um, compilation time again. And here we saw that it still did not work. So I will first exit the Julia session and then take a look around why this is the case. And of course, how stupid of me, I <laughs> set the velocity x previous to be the velocity in y. Okay, but this should then finally work. So let's run it again. And I will again skip all the way to the point when it then starts plotting. And here we go. Now it is working as it was in the intro. So the two flows are colliding with each other. We see that it's over quite fast, but we are creating wonderfully beautiful swirls here. So I will just put that into the foreground and then let's run the main function again. And you see it runs instantly because we already have everything compiled and we can look at it as often as we wish. And so also take a look at how beautifully these two streams collide into each other. And also notice how the periodic boundary conditions are yeah, working here such that when we the fluid is exiting the domain here or the swirliness, it is re-entering down here and so on and so forth. Let me run it once again. So because it's then also the end of the video, I hope you enjoyed the implementation here. Feel free to download the code from the video description play around with the parameters, change something, or also make it run faster. And if you do, then please also leave a comment or create a pull request on GitHub, such that you can share this with the wider audience who might also be interested in improving the performance of this code. If you enjoyed the video, then please leave a like and consider subscribing. Let me run this one last time. Here you will now see similar videos, and I hope to see you in the next one.